नमस्ते वेलकम टू लॉ इनफ्लैक्ट इन दिस एपिसोड वी हैव अ वेरी स्पेशल गेस्ट अ फ्रेंड ऑफ आर्स राधा जॉइनिंग अस ऑल द वे फ्रॉम द यूनाइटेड किंगडम शी इज ऐश्वर्या मोहन नाउ ऐश्वर्या इज अ सेकेंड ईयर स्टूडेंट एट द यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ साउथ हैम्पटन परसुइंग अर अंडर ग्रेजुएट डिग्री इन लॉ शी इज द फाउंडर ऑफ ऑल थिंग्स लीगल ऑल थिंग्स लीगल इज अ लीगल गाइड पेज एंड ब्लॉग विच हैज वीकली न्यूज लेटर्स कमिंग इन and these newsletters have everything to offer you on the happenings that have taken place in the commercial world be it mergers and acquisitions be it the downfall of shares or be it foreign exchange it's it's a complete guide so in this episode we are talking with ashwarya on her journey at the university of southampton why she endeavored to start this all things legal and why she chose law over medical sciences and a lot of fun So if you like this episode make sure to like share and subscribe and if you have any further suggestions or recommendations feel free to reach out to us on our youtube or on our linkedin now without wasting any further time let's jump right into the discussion right so we are uh, recording okay right so hello namaste welcome to lawn plug we have with us uh, ashwarya mohan uh, and we are so 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 thankful for her to join us today Uh, I mean, I was uh, so nervous that maybe, you know, maybe I won't get a reply back from her. Oh, maybe, uh, you know. It, Why it is that how I come across? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, tell us how are you doing today? No, I'm fine, thank you. It's it's incredibly hot here in the UK. We're having a, I think, a heat wave. So it's 31 degrees, which is nothing compared to India. But for me, I'm sweating so much. Oh my god! But how are you guys? Yeah, very good. We are doing great. That's good to hear. And actually, you're that was uh, the right, right, right. I mean, you mentioned there is you are having heat waves there. There is thirty-one degrees Celsius. I mean, someone in India would be actually happy if uh, there is thirty-one yeah, degrees Celsius. Yeah. <laughs> Why? What's the? Is it like? Uh, it's what forty degrees there in summer? In Something? some parts there is. Hmm. Yeah. Nagpur is like like too hot uh, compared to Bombay. Nagpur is uh, at forty five, forty six. Oh so my it's, god! Uh, I mean, it was uh, it was the third hottest or fourth hottest in the world, I guess, this time. Uh, behind some uh, some south some South African country, I guess, if I'm not wrong, hmm. South African smaller city or country, I don't know. I'm I'm oh, sweating. Yeah. I'm sweating by even thinking about forty five <laughs> degrees. <laughs> Too much for me. It's too much. Anything more than twenty six, twenty seven, I can't. Yeah, I it's collapse. like a way of life in India. Yeah. <laughs> right. You can't control. Can't help. It. Right. Uh, we are. We are like so. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's again hard to believe that we are finally doing this, and now that uh, now that we are live. So tell us how how have you been and like how have you been as in how have your five years or your three years journey at uh, University of Southampton been and what all activities uh, did you take part in? Um, okay, so I'm a I'm a first year student at Southampton University. So I I joined in September 2019, um, and yeah, I, I'm on the three year LLB, um, and uh, I want to pursue a career in in commercial law. So that's what I have planned for the next. For the next few years, um, you know, I, I was quite anxious to join, to join, uh, you know, law as a degree because um, I transferred from medicine, you know, uh, as you know, um, and I didn't actually have much experience in law. So when I joined Southampton, I was actually really nervous, um, but um, I was quite put at ease because the students, a lot of the students, didn't actually. Know a lot about law either, so we were all in the same boat. We were all equally confused when we went to lectures. <laughs> we were like, what, "What is this guy talking about?" Um, and so um, I was quickly put at ease. Um, and also, yeah, join, joining societies like uh, Tamil society. I even have. I, I'm even a part of uh, Hindu society, um, <laughs> where we uh, celebrate uh, Holi and Diwali together and everything. Um, so that's fun. So you know, being part of all of those experiences um, has has made the first year of Southampton bearable. <laughs> it's been good, um, but um, I'm excited to see how year two pans out and uh, how year three pans out too. 
but uh, adding to that do, do we have any indians in southampton mm. some but not too many um most of the uh international students are from uh places like korea china um and you have a few from india but it's very hard to spot i think we only have one indian transfer student um in our entire llb um i mean the entire first year of llb uh so you don't actually have that many or mo- most of them are british asian uh as opposed to just pakka indian um but uh yeah so you don't you don't ha- actually have that many so it can be isolating at times but you'll be surprised how many people who are part of you know tamil hindi hindu you know kannada telugu society um how many of them actually are a, are a part of um or like engross themselves in in indian culture even though they're born in this country and were brought up in this country they are very much a part of you know indian indian culture um so i guess you know you don't actually feel too isolated but um yeah uh, only a few people actually come from india directly right actually very good to know that yeah even in south hampton there are some indians i mean uh, someone said that you go to any place in the world there will at least be one indian there one indian <laughs> yeah <laughs> absolutely no i definitely agree with that i think uh uk is quite diverse at the moment um with um you know a lot of companies outsourcing at the moment um and throughout recent years and so many people actually come over a lot of my family actually come over for a few months work and then go back um so you'd be you'd be amazed at how many indians there actually are in slough where i live it is the indian hub it is the most diverse place in the entire of uk for having the most asians uh in a, in a city so you will find left right center up down you'll find indians everywhere indians <laughs> yeah and I, and i actually live um less than point point 1 of a mile from from two uh, hindu temples right okay yeah, so let's move on now yeah i mean you talked about commercial awareness earlier and also you know commercial awareness happens to be the most sought after quality which law firms look for and also you know law students also are looking forward to improve themselves in the concept of commercial awareness so in your yeah. opinion what exactly is commercial awareness and how can a law student develop commercial awareness see i think there's such a stigma around commercial awareness people you know first of all they they're confused by what commercial means second of all the word awareness it also comes with other words as well like commercial acumen commercial astuteness so many different words that you know law students just tend to get get quite confused um and so navigating through what it is can be quite hard um actually i would say more difficult than landing on mars um but the key thing to remember is that commercial awareness it's a journey with no destination so no one can ever 100% attain commercial awareness and believe it or not no one ever has 0% of commercial awareness everyone has at least some so then with that understanding in mind to define uh, commercial awareness we can just split it split the word up so commercial means business awareness means to have knowledge of so then commercial awareness is just in essence uh, to know of business um so then okay so what is to know of business uh this includes things like how a business actually works how it runs and how it finances itself does it have investors um does it ha- get loan from a bank how does it work um and also how different industries okay what is an industry an industry is just a collection of companies or corporations so how does an industry work how do different industries work how do different companies in industries work and then how do different industries and sectors work together that's what commercial awareness and this understanding of com- the understanding of commercial awareness that's what it basically is you know and and that's very important for law firms um and so you know especially commercial law students um and business students and finance students and whatever you know they should remember 
um, that commercial lawyers, at the end of the day, what is their job? Their job is to be legal advisors. Okay, what do advisors do? They are advised to big companies, um, part of big industries, um, about the next steps in the future of a company, right? So to be successful at advising, you need to know, and to be successful at interviewing, even for, you know, in this example, you have to know who you're interviewing or who your client is. You have to know why, you know, the deal that they need and seek legal advice for, why it's uh, important to them, why the acquisition is, a point, is important to them. Um, and uh, a stem of that will be, okay, what is their competition? Who's part of the in industry? Why do they have these competitors? How do they have these competitors, you know? And actually learning all of these and, and understanding everything, that's what commercial awareness is. And because news changes all the time, it's hard to say, I have commercial awareness. It's just, I am developing, I'm constantly developing commercial awareness. And I think that's why so many people resonate with the work that I do. Um, because my weekly news digests and you know commercial awareness guides, they actually break down information pretty well. And then the guides help supplement the digest by teaching you how to utilize what you read um, in a way that'll that'll you know improve your your commercial astuteness. And um, yeah, I think I think that's why it's so important to have. It just helps you become a better advisor, a better legal advisor. Rajas, I bet you, I, you, I mean, we can't get a much apt answer as Ashwara ma'am did now. Right, right. I, was, I was actually going to say that if, if some teacher of ours uh, is viewing this, she would, she would definitely give you a 5 on 5. <laughs> yeah, you know, not exactly a 5 on 5, you know, still, still 4 on 5 because, you know, Indian teachers have that ego. They have that mentality. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, they I don't know why. See, I'll tell you why 4 on 5 because you didn't mention the most important case in this field. <laughs> What's the most important case in this field? Wait, oh, that, you tell the most important case. <laughs> that's a mystery. I mean, you take any answer to our teacher and they say, you have not mentioned any precedents. Okay, <laughs> but what precedent? <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> that's actually Fine. correct. Every single time that I answer a question, they say, okay, but what's the authority? I'm like, Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at least the point which you are making is correct, right? Then why do you need mm. the authorities? I mean, <laughs> is it the same in UK? Yeah, absolutely. You have to mention some type of precedent or authority, or else you just won't get marks. <laughs> which I think is fair enough, but... <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you argue in court, you always have to argue on the basis of authority, right. so... Yeah, of course, so it, it makes sense. Right, makes right, sense. right. Okay. I'm so moving ahead. You have a skill in legal writing. You have been a legal writer. You have your own blog. Yeah, mm. in fact. And I wanted to ask you that see, legal writing is an art, right? But mm. nowadays, what many people do is that they, I mean, if I want to write an article, I'll take something from this article, I'll compile this from this article, I'll take this article, I'll simply copy paste. And just for mm. the sake of getting an article in my CV, I will mm. just submit it to a journal, but not actually, mm. you know, going for you know something new or you know thinking something new. Yeah. I mean, legal writing is supposed to be an art, but it is not treated an art nowadays. Yeah. What is your take on that? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree because I think the market is so, or people's perception of the market is that it is so saturated. Everyone's spoken about everything now. There is nothing that I can speak about that hasn't been spoken about before. So why should I put my time and energy towards uh, writing something when I can just cut, paste, you know, join together and just serve it on a plate? But um, see, with me though, I'm someone who has a lot of strong opinions or I'm someone that when I read something, I, I instantly say, I, I, I agree or I disagree or... I think he has a point, but uh, that he needs to also consider this. So, because I have that quality about myself, you know, to me, legal writing and the art of legal writing, it, it gives you, you know, freedom to, um, to actually dissect and critically engage uh, with a piece of work, whether, you know, that's a judge's comment, 
So in uh, a lot of our exams, we'll get judges' comments and we have to dissect that and uh, say what we think about that uh, and bring in precedence and authority. Um, but um, so in that sense, um, I think art of legal writing is quite under underappreciated because people don't really understand or view it as an art, you know, and so it's kind of changed and, mold, you know, evolved from what it actually is to something that is just, oh, you can just produce, you know, copy and paste from a bunch of work and this is legal writing. Wow, send it off. No, <laughs> but that's not what it is. And so um, I personally really appreciate um, the art of legal writing. But I don't think I've mastered it because, of course, I think this too is a journey. Um, but uh, yeah, I think um, I think it's very important to to appreciate and have. Right, right, right. Uh, moving on. Uh, so in India, what the culture is in law schools is that uh, you know they give a lot of weightage to publications uh, and to legal writing. So in uh, India, if you have to prove, uh, or you know you have to indeed, you have to prove that you are amongst the most employable people in an university. So mm. you have to show them that A, you are you have participated in like a lot of moves and you have won them. Two, you have a lot of publications to your name. Uh, and three, maybe your grades, obviously your grades. So uh, a, a quick uh, quick take on how uh, exactly it works in UK. So for us, it also works similarly. So obviously your grades. Um, how many moots you do is, it is important because it, it shows how confident you are. Um, and that's important as both a solicitor and a barista. Uh, I say barista, I mean barista. Um, but those are kind of like extracurricular things that you don't necessarily need to take a part, be a part of. There are, you know, several things that you can do um, to show off that you're um we have some compulsory moots which we have to do as a part of a of a module in our university uh course um but that's only one and then after that it'll, it's all extra curricular um there are other things like negotiation competitions so you ha you have a scenario and you have to negotiate with someone else uh with another team and that's a competition in its own right um and that can also demonstrate that you know but you don't need to do that kind of stuff for me I find interest in that kind of th those kinds of things. So um, I've taken part in a lot of moots and also negotiation competitions, also human rights debates and things like that. Uh, but people can also stand out by doing things like um, like making a legal blog, and and you know like like you said, uh, doing legal journals uh, and doing legal articles. Um, all of that I think is is the same as in India, except the weightage is less. I think there is more weightage on your grades. Uh, and I, I can only speak about commercial law because that's what I want to pursue. But there is a huge weightage on commercial awareness. Um, and also just some weightage on uh, actually, you know, taking part in moots and competitions and stuff like that to demonstrate. Because I think you, the application process that we have in the UK, uh, you can demonstrate, you know, that you're a good student in many other different ways than more practical point, you know, practical ways. So yeah, I think that that that's the difference um, between the Indian education system for law and here. Right, right, right. right. Very insightful. Ava, you have something to add to it? Yeah, I had one thing. I mean, yeah, I mean, as Rajas earlier mentioned that yeah, it is all things are taken into consideration equally. I mean, but what mm -hmm. you said, yeah, the grades are given more weightage. Yeah, that is, yeah, that that is also true to some extent in India. But yeah, in law firms, yeah, look for grades. I mean, it is yeah. not looked at equally, but I mean, yeah, grades, seventy percent grades and rest of all thirty percent. Mm. That is it, like. Mm. I think, actually, in the UK, I I wouldn't even say that it's seventy percent, because. You know, the most important thing that they look for is that you will be a good advisor. You will be a good um, uh, public speaker. Um, and so, you know, whilst grades are given arguably the most importance, 
I think nevertheless, it's something like 55% right. <laughs> grades and then 45% everything else because grades don't tell you or don't tell a recruiter everything. Like realistically, uh, an A or a first or a two one or whatever, whatever the grading system is, on a, on a piece of paper is not going to tell the recruiter how well you speak. And so, you know, in that sense, I think I, I disagree with the whole seven, you know, 70% uh, consideration of grades in India thing. I think India uh, and Indian companies should consider grades less because that doesn't actually uh, portray how a person is actually going to perform, especially throughout the years. You can't extrapolate. It's very uh, risky to extrapolate how uh, much potential a person has from, from their grades. Um, so yeah, I think in the UK, that's much more realized. I know from the Indian, you know, because my parents studied in India and everything, if you don't get 95%, if you don't get first, between one and the first and, and the 10th rank, then you're, you're seen as not good enough. So I, th I understand why grades has given so much of a weightage in India. But uh, I disagree with that whole ranking system, uh, and I disagree that um, that so much weight should be given to grades in when considering employment and things like that. Me too. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, see, law firms, be it in India or be it in UK, they have this one goal that the client should go away happy. <laughs> yeah. The client won't care if you have ninety percent or sixty percent. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly that. Absolutely, hundred percent agree. Now that uh, now that you have uh, mentioned that you are you know into commercial laws and you are uh, you are becoming a pro at legal writing is what we can get out from the mm -hmm. conversation till now. Mm -hmm. uh, so tell us how how has the journey been uh, you know founding a commercial law newsletter that is all things legal. Mm -hmm. uh, was it so was it like uh, you know did you uh, did you like uh, did you go about all things legal uh, with improving your commercial writing in back of the mind or was it that you know I have to do something different I have to be uh, have to stand out from the crowd so what mm. was the rationale behind starting it okay well i started all things legal back in march um when i began uh, when i began uh, stock trading so i actually um i i trade forex i also trade oil um, and so you know a big part of of doing trading is that you have to be up to date with with news um you know and as in the case with so many law students, um, I found it really difficult to start because the new, the amount of news that was that was um, on my feed was just so much, and I just couldn't couldn't actually keep you know on top of all of my news. Um, and I didn't when I read it, I didn't actually understand that much, um, and so I, I quickly became quite reluctant to um, to actually uh, you know keep up to date with news. Um, and to be a successful trader, you have to always read news all the time, make links, you know, and predict the future, whatever. Um, and so I thought, okay, I can't be the only person that, that feels like this. I can't be the only law student or even business finance accounting student that feels so overwhelmed by, by commercial news, by business news. Um, so I thought, okay, let me make a newsletter on LinkedIn, just for fun, uh, whether anyone else reads it or not. The, the aim was to help people um, and at the same time to motivate myself to constantly keep, in, you know, keep up to date with, with um, commercial news. Um, and then this took off immensely. You know, I started doing it for like, I did it for three weeks or so, so three, three articles and immediately it took off. Um, and everyone started to comment and it started to go, you know, viral and whatnot. Uh, and so I thought, okay, how can I harness the platform that I have? Because I went from maybe having 300 followers to now I have 1,500, 1,600 uh, on my personal page. Um, on my All Things Legal page, I have about, uh, I'm close to getting 500 followers now. And I only started in March. Um, so when this started to take off immensely, I thought, okay, how can I harness this uh, and spread other messages? So as you both know, I'm, you know, very humanitarian based. Like I, I want to spread uh, awareness about humanitarian and diversity related topics. Um, and, you know, 
LinkedIn can be so like, it can be so cold at times because everyone just wants to post um, what they think recruiters want to see. And I think in that sense, it's even worse than things like Instagram and Facebook, where people are pressured to post things that make them look like they have a better life. I think LinkedIn is even worse um, because it, it, they people want to post things that re graduate recruiters will see and be like, oh, we should, you know, hire her, whatever, you know? And so it lacks a lot of humanity, you know? And, um, you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement that's going on right now, barely anyone's spoken about it. And, I, you know, I'm speaking about it because I'm, you know, obviously so passionate. Um, it's not just about about all things legal. I'm genuinely so passionate about, about uh, raising awareness on things like mental health, racial equality, gender equality, disability awareness, and all of that stuff. But I saw like no one else is talking about this. So I thought, okay, let me at least use my platform to um, to actually create a space where that can be openly discussed. Um, and so that's how All Things Legal began. Uh, it's a legal blog. Um, I, taught, I have different collaborations like this one, different collaborations coming up as well, um, which talk about not just commercial law, but also diversity. Um, and I should add as the diversity and inclusion officer at my law society, um, you know, it became even more important for me to speak about these things and spread awareness to my law society as well. So that's why I thought, okay, I'll use All Things Legal to do that as well. So that's kind of how um, All Things Legal was founded. Uh, it started from my genuine passion of doing some trading uh, then it moved on to commercial awareness, uh, and then it and then it's now evolved to encompassing more humanitarian diversity and commercial uh, topics um, for law students and actually anyone who who's interested in commercial um, in the commercial world. Um, and uh, the aim is to hopefully teach some people. You know, when they come and visit my my page, um, they'll learn some things about commercial law, but they'll also learn some things about themselves and uh, better themselves uh, and learn some things about others. And so that's, that, that's how All Things Legal came about. Wonderful. Uh, this is actually very, uh, how can I say this? You know, for me, it is very inspirational. A. And B, uh, it's also very you know, fun to hear that someone who started it, not uh, expecting it to grow like this big, is now become much more responsible yeah. with the startup so uh, yeah I mean, uh, absolutely absolutely and, because now now that everything has um has shot up which i didn't expect at all now i'm considering okay maybe i should make a website um or maybe i should uh you know create a youtube channel um and all of that kind of stuff so now i'm like kind of you know evolving into into new territories which i genuinely did not expect i did not expect anyone to listen to my work i didn't think people cared enough um so it was a major con confidence boost so actually that's something that i should mention i have a website coming up hopefully it'll be called allthingslegal.com um but that's to be confirmed soon um because i'm I'm also going through like a rebranding stage, so it may still be called All Things Legal, but um, there might there may be like a few changes. So um, I have a website coming up. Um, I also have a podcast coming up in September with a friend of mine. We're working um, together as part of All Things Legal to do a, a, a fortnightly commercial awareness podcast where we talk about different news and stuff like that, whatever, whatever's going on in the legal world. Um, and also I'll be having a mailing list so that um, all students can sign up to the mailing list and my newsletters will, and amongst other things, my newsletters will just directly every single week be in, in their mailing list, uh, sorry, in their email so that anyone can read it at any time on the go, on, the, on their way to work, on their way to university. And in that way, it makes learning commercial, developing commercial awareness a lot easier. So I, I just thought I'd mention that as well. Exactly. I mean, learning commercial awareness, one problem which many students face is that they don't find, find out what the correct sources are for reading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. If, if I had to tell, if I had to say, okay, uh, what are the best sources to read? I would definitely say subscribe to Finimize, Bloomberg, um, 
Financial Times is quite expensive, so I haven't personally done that. Uh, if you have an Apple phone, then Apple News, uh, there's, they have their own app for that. Um, lawcareers.net. Uh, uh, fxstreet.com, which talks about uh, the foreign exchange market. Uh, and equally, it talks about things like oil um, and energy, which is uh, a big part of, uh, you know, law firms, a, a, a lot of law firms. Uh, specialize in, in, in the energy uh, resources sector. So um, those would be the, the top websites that I would suggest to subscribe to. Um, I think, um, yeah, I, I definitely think those are the best. And, and those are definitely the ones that I use uh, for my news digests. Uh, yeah, and yeah, after that I was going to say that if you, you know, make that gamble easy, it is even better, right? So someone like you, yeah, I mean, if it directly reaches the email, yeah, it is much easier. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Right. I uh, before Amai proceeds with the next question, I uh, now because you have told us that you are coming up with a website and you are taking this to a next level by launching a podcast. Mm. So my question is, uh, you know, in three, give us three tips why we should follow all things legal why you should follow all things legal 